Thank you, team. Church, if you have a copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn with me uh, to John chapter 18. John 18, and together we'll be looking at uh, 18, verse 28, uh, and then we'll make our way over to chapter 19, uh, verse 16. John 18, beginning in verse 28. Uh, you know when you, uh, when, when you begin a new job, how you spend the first couple of days in orientation, isn't that just a great time? You get to watch videos, and you get to hear uh, all the spill about the company and how great it is and what you can expect as an employee and what they expect from you as an employee. You get to sit in that orientation, and I know it's just bukus of fun. Well, this morning, I want to do something kind of similar, uh, but I hope it will be maybe a little less painless uh, than those kinds of orientations. From our passage, I want to give you an orientation to what life is like in Jesus' kingdom. What is life like in His kingdom? And if you already belong to that kingdom, which what does it mean to belong to it? Well, it means that you've repented of your sin and you're trusting in Christ alone for your salvation. That's what it means to belong to that kingdom. If that's you and you already belong, then I hope that this sermon will serve as a reminder to you of what life ought to be like in this kingdom because sometimes we can forget. But if you're here this morning and you know that you don't belong to Jesus, you know that you're not a part of His kingdom, then I hope that maybe this sermon will introduce you to Him and orient you to what life in His kingdom is like. If you're here because you're curious to know, then I pray that the Lord would use His Word to help answer those questions for you. Amen? But before we do that, let's kind of put this passage in its context. So uh, a few weeks ago, however long it's been, back in John chapter 18, verse 1, we know that that's when the Gospel of John kind of turns the corner and the storyline is now moving toward the events that will eventually lead to Jesus going to the cross. It begins in a garden at night outside of Jerusalem, a place where Jesus went frequently with His disciples and spent a lot of time with them there. And that's exactly why Judas knew this would be a good place to go to capture Jesus, maybe catch Him unaware. So one of the disciples that Jesus walked with for three years, one of the disciples that He talked with, that He shared meals with, that He led Bible studies with, betrayed Him into the hands of Roman authorities. And so, what we know though, is that the Roman guards didn't have to run after Him. They didn't have to pursue Him. They didn't have to post wanted signs all over Jerusalem. Jesus gave Himself over to the Roman authorities because His ultimate mission was to give His life for our sin. And so Jesus allows Himself to be arrested. Then last week, we saw, if, if before that one of His disciples betrayed Him, last week we saw how one of His disciples and friends denied Him. Acted like He didn't know anything about Jesus. Peter denied Christ three times while Jesus was standing before Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. Thanks be to God, in John 21 we see that Peter is restored. Um, but if you've ever felt betrayed by a friend, the Lord Jesus can sympathize with you even in that. He he experienced the very worst that this world has to offer. In the moment that he needed his disciples the most, they betrayed him and they denied him. But that's what brings us to our text this morning. Is now Jesus is being taken from the high priest Caiaphas and he's being taken to Pilate. Pilate was a Roman governor. Judea at this time was not allowed to be independent. Instead, Rome kind of had its finger on them and said, you know what, you guys can still have the temple, and you can still do all of your Jewish stuff that you guys like to do, uh, but Rome's going to be in charge here. And so they had a Roman governor that they placed over Judea, and his name is Pilate. And so in this narrative, and in history, Pilate very much represented the power of Rome. In a, in a way of, of, of speaking, what we see in this text are two kingdoms. We see the kingdom of Christ, and we see the kingdom of this world. Rome represents that kind of worldly power. 
And what I want us to see is how different they are. I want to share with you three traits of what Jesus' kingdom is like. And we're going to see that through His conversation with Pilate. And so with that, let's now read this text together. John chapter 18, beginning in verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord or do others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After this, or after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. 19 verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold, the man... When the chief priests and the officer saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He then entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Okay, so three traits of Jesus' kingdom. What is his kingdom like? For those of you who take notes, get your pen ready. Here we go. Trait number one. Jesus' kingdom is otherworldly. It is not of this world. 
Jesus' kingdom is otherworldly. It is not of this world. When the Jews get Jesus to Pilate and say, look, we're having trouble with this guy, Pilate assumes, look, okay, <laughs> if this is some kind of theological dispute that you guys are having among yourselves, some kind of intramural, you know, you guys disagree about what the Bible says or whatever, that's on y'all, okay? So y'all go take him and figure that out for yourself. I'm here to make sure that the taxes get paid and no one tries to be king over Rome. All right? That's my role. And then they respond by saying, look, we can't do that because we're not allowed to put anyone to death. Uh Oh, we just leveled up a little bit right there. Because they they were right. The Jews in, in this time did not have the authority to carry out the death penalty. Rome had to be the one to give their approval on that and actually carry that out. And so that kind of startles Pilate a little bit, and he decides to bring Jesus into his headquarters. And what is the first question that, Jesus, or excuse me, that Pilate asked Jesus? You can see his political fear coming to the surface here. Are you the king of the Jews? Are you claiming to be a king? Because if you're claiming to be a king, now we are going to have some problems. Because there's only one king in this land. His name is Caesar. So are you the king? Rome at this time was very obsessed with maintaining the peace of their empire. You could do a lot of things. You could have a lot of freedoms in the Roman Empire, but one thing you could not do would, would, would be to threaten their power. And if you did that, they had no problem extinguishing you. Okay, And so that's the question that Pilate asked Jesus because he wants to know, are you setting yourself up as a, as a rebel against Rome? And then how does Jesus respond? Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. This world did not produce my kingdom. This world did not manufacture my kingdom. This kingdom that Jesus leads is from another world. And we know this church because Jesus Himself is from another world, isn't He? Jesus stepped in to our world from heaven. Because this world would never have a kingdom like Christ. This world that is marred in sin and death and destruction. As a matter of fact, let me just give you a quick survey of how John's Gospel describes the world that we live in. You ready for it? Here we go. We're going to run through these quickly. In John chapter 1, verse 10, John says, Even though the world was made through Him, that is through Christ, even though the world was made through Christ, it did not know Him. That's not a, an innocent ignorance. That's a sinful suppressing of the truth. That we did not know the One who made us. In chapter 3, verse 19, Jesus says, here's the testimony. Light has come into the world, that is me, Christ Jesus. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. In chapter 7, verse 5, Jesus' brothers tell Him, hey, if you're all that, why don't you go and show off some of your tricks down in Jerusalem during the feast? Get you a good following if you really are who you say you are. And Jesus told His brothers, He said, My time has not yet come. And then He says this, chapter 7, verse 5, The world cannot hate you, but it hates Me because I testify that its works are evil. In chapter 8, verses 23 to 24, Jesus, speaking to the religious leaders, He tells them that you are of this world, and because you're of this world, you will die in your sins. Not a great way to win friends and influence people, telling the religious leaders of the day, you're of the world and you will perish in your sin unless you believe that I'm God. And so, that, by the way, should shape how we understand the love of God. Probably one of the most well-known verses in this Gospel is John 3.16. I bet you can quote it from memory. For God so what? Loved the world that He gave His only begotten, or you and ears, one and only <laughs> Son that whoever believes in Him would not what? But have eternal life. And D.A. Carson in his commentary says, what makes the love of God so extravagant is not how big the world is, but how bad the world is. It should catch us off guard that God would show love to sinners like us. An ancient audience would have been surprised by God's love. They would have assumed God's judgment Today, modern, us, us modern people, we take offense at God's judgment and we assume He must love us because that's His job. But the love of God in Christ should really kind of catch us off guard a little bit to realize, you would love me 
even though I've sinned against you, you would love me? Anyway, be that as it may. Pilate himself in this passage also shows that he is of this world. When Jesus says that I bear witness to the truth and everyone who belongs to the truth listens to me, and then what question does Pilate ask him? What is truth? But you know what? That was the wrong question. The question should have been, who is truth? Because truth was standing right in front of him. Remember in John 14, Jesus told his disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He had truth standing face to face and he couldn't see it. And the crowd likewise showed that they belonged to the kingdom of this world. When, when he brings Jesus out to them and, and Pilate says, I find no fault in him. But I tell you what, we got a custom here that during the Passover, I release to you a criminal. So why don't we just call it even, we'll make Jesus our criminal, I'll release him to you, and then we can all go home. But instead, they demand the release of a guy named Barabbas, who was a robber. Or, that word there could also mean an insurrectionist. Kind of an interesting irony there, that they would rather have someone who might actually rebel against Rome be released rather than Christ. How deep their hatred ran for Jesus. The origins of Jesus' kingdom are not of this world because Jesus is not of this world. He stepped into this world from another. And His kingdom is breaking into this world through His work. The light has shone into the darkness in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And in the 2,000 years since He came, His kingdom has still been advancing. Not through political forces or military might. That's what had Pilate scared to death. But instead, the kingdom of Christ advances as the church proclaims the gospel of God's grace to sinners. That's how the kingdom moves forward in this world. And you and I get to be a part of that. When we trust in Christ, we get to be a part of His kingdom. And we are participating in His kingdom breaking into this world. Into this world of sin and ruin and darkness and decay. And so let me ask you, Christian, do you live as if that is true of you? Do you live as if this world is your home? Is the way you spend your time, your money, the relationships you invest in and prioritize, the activities you pursue? Or do you live as if you are a sojourner who's looking for a better city, a city whose founder and builder is Christ Jesus Himself? Do you understand yourself as a citizen of this kingdom? And does your life look any different from your non-believing friends and neighbors and co-workers? Augustine, in the year 426, it's been a little while, in the year 426, he wrote a book called City of God. And in it, he describes the dynamic that you and I live in every day, is that the city of man is the world and its system and the way that it does things and its sin and its darkness. But he says the city of God has now invaded the city of man. That through Christ and all those who trust in Christ, we are now living as the city of God, even as we dwell within the city of man. That's our identity, church. And So does the way you live reflect that? Trait number one, Jesus' kingdom is otherworldly. It is not of this world. Trait number two, it is characterized, Jesus' kingdom is characterized by sacrificial love, not violence. His kingdom is characterized by sacrificial love, not violence. Notice in verse, uh, let's see. Yeah, verse 38. Look with me in 38. When Pilate, after he talks with Jesus, he comes out to the crowd and he tells them, this is the very tail end of 38, he says, I find no guilt in him. He's innocent. And then look at what Pilate does in 19 verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. So Pilate has just sent an innocent man to be flogged. And I'm not going to go into the gory details of what all that looked like. What you and I, I think, need to understand is that Rome was very good at torturing people to the point that they would want to die. They were experts in that. And so Pilate sends Jesus to be flogged. Why does he do this? You know, I think it could be a little bit of a flex. 
Rome flexing its muscles here a little bit. You know, maybe Jesus is innocent, but you know what? He's done enough to cause enough of a stir here. It'd probably do him some good just to get him out and get him flogged. Probably wouldn't hurt anything. And in that way, notice how Rome exercises its power. Rome exercised its power through force and through violence. You will submit, or you will face the consequences. So he has him flogged, and then he's mocked, and then he's brought back out to the crowd. And Pilate, again, makes an attempt to release him. But then the crowd responds, Hey, you know what? Pilate, did you know that this guy claimed to be the Son of God? Now, in the Roman Empire, Caesar was often referred to as being a Son of God. Is this another claim to political authority? And so John tells us that made Pilate even more afraid. I think there was some political fear that Pilate had. I think also there could have been some legitimate spiritual fear. Could this really be God's Son that I'm dealing with here? And so he has a second conversation with Jesus. And this time he decides to throw his weight around a little bit. He says, where are you from? And Jesus wouldn't answer. And you can almost hear the anger in Pilate's voice. You're not going to talk to me now? Do you know who I am? I could have you crucified. You understand that, right? I'm the one that's going to make the decision here. And then Jesus calmly, very collected, says... The only authority you have is what's been given you from above. And look back at verse, or look back in chapter 18, and let's see who's actually in authority here. Look at 18, verse 32. When the Jews tell Pilate, we can't put him to death, you guys are going to have to okay that. And then look at verse 32. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. What kind of death would he die? It would be death by crucifixion. But not only that, it would be a sacrificial death. It would be a death for the good of others. So notice the difference between the kingdom of man and the kingdom of Christ. Rome exercised its power and authority through brutality. Through violence. Jesus used His authority and His power for our good to lay His life down. That's The difference. His kingdom is characterized by sacrificial love, not violence. The one who has unbounded strength and authority used it not for selfish gain, but he used it for the eternal good of others. Every other earthly ruler has sought to gain power for selfish ends, but Christ used His to save us from eternal death. So again, Christian, let me ask you, if that is our King who used His authority to pursue sacrificial love, if that's who we're following, then are you seeking to sacrificially love others? Especially other believers, those who belong to the household of faith. Or is your life consumed in your own priorities and interests and trying to make sure you get ahead? You know, one fruit of the Spirit that I think, I know I would, and maybe there's some that would resonate with this, Um, we live in a world that is filled with outrage, anger, social media has seemed to amplify that. Everyone has a microphone to tell the world once and for all, this is what it is, to share my opinion. It's not very diplomatic most of the time. We live in in, in an outrage culture. And I wonder if, maybe as Christians, we ought to spend more time praying for the fruit of gentleness in our lives. To be gentle, that when you're reviled, you do not revile in return. You don't lose your cool. You follow the example of your king here. Trait number two of Jesus' kingdom is that it's characterized by sacrificial love and not violence. And number three, it is composed of those who receive Christ, not ethnicity. Jesus' kingdom, the people that make up that kingdom, are composed of those who receive Christ, not ethnicity. Look with me in um, 12, chapter 19, verse 12. So then Pilate, from then on, he was trying to release him, but the Jews cried out, 
And notice their political response here. They're trying to intimidate Pilate into doing what they want him to do. Verse 12, they say, the Jews, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Do you hear that, Pilate? The one who's writing your check? You let him go, you let this Jesus go, and you're making a clear statement about what you think about Caesar. They're trying to bully him into doing what they want him to do, into crucifying him. And they continue throughout this final paragraph, they continue to demand his crucifixion. And then finally, in verse 15, Pilate gives them one more chance. Look with me there in 15. They cried out, Away with Him! Away with Him! Crucify Him! And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your King? The question could not be any clearer. And the answer that they give, likewise, could not have been any clearer. The chief priest answered, We have no King but Caesar. What have they just said? They've just said, we still belong to this world. Now if anyone, if we would have expected anyone to receive Christ gladly, if we would have expected anyone to roll out the welcome mat for Christ, you would think it would have been these Jewish leaders. Surely, they're the ones who would have. But how do they respond to Christ? When their king is standing right in front of them, they reject Him. And they tell him, we have no king but Caesar. Words that I'm sure would haunt them for the rest of their lives. In other words, even though they were Jews, they've just said by their own admission that they belong to the world with Caesar as their king. And this shouldn't surprise us again. In John's prologue back in chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, listen to what John says. Christ came to His own, His own people, and His own did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, that all there meaning whoever, whoever, whatever ethnicity you are, whatever background you come from, but any who did receive Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. If we have placed our faith in Christ, then our primary identity marker is not our ethnicity, and it's not any of the other ways that we might divide ourselves out. Your socioeconomic status, your, whether you're male or female, whether you're um, rich or poor, or whether you're this or that, we try to divide ourselves out. But what we have in common, what brings us together, what unites us, is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That is where we find our common ground. That is where we are united. It is in the finished work of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 3, Jesus described it as being born from above or being born again. When we place saving faith in Christ, then we no longer belong to this world, but we, like Jesus, now belong to another world. We belong to His kingdom. Listen to what Jesus said in 1714. John 1714. Uh, Again, not the year, but the chapter and the verse. 17.14, he says, I have given them your word. He's praying to the Father about his disciples. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Christ's kingdom is not defined by geopolitical boundaries. Christ's kingdom is not defined by modern nation states. The citizens of His kingdom are those who have repented of their sin and turned toward Christ in faith. And, to put it in the language of Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, it is a kingdom made up of people from every nation and tribe and tongue. That is who makes up the kingdom of Christ. And so, two points of application here. First, Let's not be satisfied with racially segregated churches. I think in our context where we live, that's become socially acceptable. But let us be a community of faith that doesn't distinguish ourselves based on race. Let us distinguish ourselves based on our common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died to purchase our unity. 
And then let's also aim to be global Christians. I hope that you pray for the spiritual renewal of America. I hope that you pray that God in His mercy will bring revival to America, that we would see people repent and believe the gospel. But let me also ask you this, for as often as you are praying for America, are you also praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters all around the world? Do they have a place in your heart? Because the truth is this, you and I as Christians... We have infinitely and eternally more in common with a believer from Uganda than we have with our non-believing fellow American. Christ's kingdom is made up of those who have repented and believed the gospel. So let's be global Christians. What is His kingdom like? Its origins are not of this world. It is characterized by sacrificial love, not violence. And it is composed of those who have received Him by faith, not our ethnicity or any other way we might try to identify ourselves. So Christian, one final question. Does your life reflect your citizenship in this kingdom? Does it shape the way you spend your time the relationships you invest in, the activities you pursue, the priorities you make? Does your life show any difference from the non-believers in your life? And for those here this morning who maybe right now you don't understand yourself to be a Christian, you've not repented of your sin and turned toward Him in faith, let me ask you, you've now heard what His kingdom is like. Do you want to be a part of that kingdom? The entrance to that kingdom is through repentance of sin. That is, realizing that your sin has put you at odds with God. And so are you ready to turn from your sin and to turn to Christ in faith? And what I want to do, I'm going to invite Chris to come on back up, brother, with the team. And as they're making their way, I want us to spend some time in prayer to reflect on the truths that we've heard this morning. And ask yourself, if you're a believer... Here today, ask yourself, take a spiritual inventory. Does my life reflect Christ's kingdom? Am I living in a way that shows that my identity and my citizenship is in that kingdom and no longer in this world? If you're not a believer, I want you to ask yourself, why did you come to this gathering? Is it because you want to know more? And is it because maybe you are ready to enter into that kingdom through repentance and faith? And if that is so then you can take this moment right now. And it doesn't have to be any specific words. This is not an incantation. In your heart, you express to the Lord that you are ready to come to faith in Christ and that you're ready to follow Him. Amen? Let's spend some time in prayer together. And guys, whenever you're ready, leave us in song.